So good evening, everybody. And I'd like to begin with Am Israel Chai, because I think that this is uh, very important uh, for all of us, um, both in the diaspora and in Israel. And thank you for taking the time and for inviting me to speak with you. I don't need to tell you, you all know that Israel is going through a very, very difficult and challenging time. After the first two days, um, in which there was a very big confusion, everybody, including everybody, um, government, as well as the army, the Shabak, the Mossad, the police, everybody's on their tiptoe. And you can see it, you can feel it everywhere in the country. My angle uh, this evening will be the Arab angle, the geostrategy of um, how things look, and I apologize in advance. It's not a very pretty picture at this moment in time. So it's probably quite obvious to everyone on the Zoom that there is a mastermind behind this um, attack. I don't even want to call it an attack, but what happened uh, approximately two weeks ago on October 7th, it's not even an attack. An attack is too small a word for it. It is something that has been premeditated and planned meticulously to the point of where each uh, particular place, civilian place in each of the villages is and how many people are in it, how many dogs are in each house. This is the, uh, the, the level of uh, minute details that the planning went to. And this was found in the bodies of Hamas operatives uh, that went in after they were either caught or shot dead by IDF soldiers, the police, etc. But what Iran um, is planning basically is putting this particular event, despite it being horrific, the worst by far attack and atrocious um, behavior towards human beings in general. Even volunteers in Zaka uh, have broken down and said that in 75 years of existence of the state of Israel, they hadn't seen um, this kind of um, behavior uh, from one human being toward another. But this is only the first plan in the wide um, roadmap, let's call it this way, by Iran, planned by Iran. What the Iranians are looking for is regional and world domination. I know it sounds like a horror film and like science fiction, but I hope that I will impress upon you not to belittle this message. That's what they are looking for. It's a Shiite imperialistic kind of a, 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 a focus. Uh, and they are willing to use anything and all means to promote uh, their end. And their end, and this is an extremely important tool uh, to, to impress the West with, but this is true. They don't care for the Palestinians one little bit. For them, the Hamas and the Hezbollah, despite the Hezbollah being Shiite, but still, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, working as their long arms, not to mention the Houthis in Yemen, which have taken a leap via Yemen, already uh, paneling Israel with rockets, um, which have been intercepted thus far by the United States. But all of these, for the Iranians, these are Arabs. Uh -huh. And I'm going to speak very bluntly for the Iranians, for the Persian Mullah entity, and I'm saying particularly Mullah entity and the leadership in Iran and not the people, but for the Mullah leaders, for them, the Arab proxies, namely the Hamas, the Hezbollah, the Islamic Jihad, and so on, they're nothing. They're displaceable. They don't care about them. They don't care about their people. They don't care about the cause. It's not the ideology of Palestine or Al Quds, etc. It's imperialistic domination, regional 
domination. And this is very important to understand in order to comprehend what we're dealing with. Now, the Hamas has said what it is going to do. It said, and it still is saying in Arabic, clearly, without uh, uh, any kind of politically correct or softness or, or uh, innuendos, they say it clearly in Arabic, in a very uh, surreal kind of Arabic, a very melodramatic kind of Arabic, but they say that the South of Israel, Gaza is the first uh, uh, step. The second step for Hamas, I'm talking about Hamas, the second step is the West Bank, not the Northern Front, the West Bank, which Iran has been working systematically to ignite for years. Not one month, not two months, not one year, but at least for several months. Understanding the weakness of the uh, Fatah uh, regime in the West Bank, understanding that it is corrupt, and, and almost disintegrated, plus the fact that Israel has weakened that particular leadership in the West Bank throughout the years and has more or less bought the quiet from Hamas, or so it had thought, by having Qatar send money to Hamas operatives. Please remind me if I forget to say a word about Qatar, which is very critical. But Iran has been systematically working in the West Bank to disintegrate the stability. This is what makes their work much easier. Like in Lebanon, disintegrated Lebanon makes a wonderful platform for Iran to work in. Disintegrated Syria makes a wonderful platform for Iran to work with. And in the same manner, the West Bank has been worked at for months and years with Hamas and with Islamic Jihad, paying them, training them, inciting them. Now, it doesn't help that both the Hamas and the West Bank, in other words, the Fatah leadership led by Abu Mazen, this is the Palestinian Authority, has in their school books horrific incitement. And I'd like to impress upon you that of all the countries in the region, even Egypt, which doesn't let anybody go near its internal affairs, has already worked on their internal books, on their school books, on their incitement. It's not perfect, but it has been amended to be more tolerant, less anti-Semitic, and less anti-Zionist. Even Qatar has improved a little bit. Saudi Arabia has made progress on the issue of incitement in their school books. Of course, the UAE and Bahrain, but the Palestinian Authority and Jordan, zero movement, nothing, nothing but incitement, which feeds and nurtures the people. So when we try to make the differentiation, and there is a difference between the West Bank and Gaza, of course, in Gaza is the Islamic Hamas, they hate the Fatah, they lynched the Fatah operatives when they took over the Gaza Strip. They literally threw them out of the windows after shooting them in the knees. And those Fatah operatives ran to the IDF to be saved. But in the West Bank, granted having a different leadership, not an Islamic leadership, called the Fatah being very uh, antagonistic to the Hamas, still there is a huge amount of incitement plus the working of Iran constantly to try and incite its own ideology, ideology, its own agenda into the young people. And this mix, this explosive mix is making things very difficult in the West Bank as well. Add to that the yeah. Northern Front. The Northern Front, I don't need to tell you, the Hezbollah has for years and years become stronger and stronger, a very significant Shiite militia. Iran has constantly uh, transported weapons and know-how and funding via the Hezbollah to Syria in order to prepare its standing vis-a-vis -vis Israel when D-Day comes. All of this more or less 
is known generally. What is less spoken of is the constant and very meticulous activity of Iran in Jordan as well. I remind you that Jordan is a, supposedly an island of stability for the United States in the region, supposedly something that is between Israel and Iran. But in recent, I think one could say almost two years, the Iranians have suddenly found and remembered that they have religious Shiite sites to take care of inside Jordan, particularly on the Jordanian-Israeli border. And I've been yelling and shouting both in the Knesset and writing op-eds in the Jerusalem Post and speaking on different outlets abroad as well about the Iranians trying to use the Jordanian-Israeli border, but also the West Bank and trying to set up cells Amid, it's not politically correct, but it is true. Israeli Arabs, of course, not all of them at all in any way, but amid certain Arab Israelis, Islamic oriented Arab Israelis, in order to have them quietly prepare cells and wait for D Day. I know it sounds like a horror movie, but that's what it is. And in cities like Nazareth, I'm talking about a small, very tiny proportion, but there are amazing platforms because of the rising crime and violence amidst Arab Israelis in the past decade or so, even two decades, more than 100,000 illegal weapons are running around amidst Arab Israelis inside Israel, I'm talking about blue and white ID Arab Israelis. This is the crime and violence scene in Israel. And those have been murdering other Arabs, whether it's Hamula gangs killing one another, whether it's protection money and, and that kind of thing, which has become extremely, extremely, uh, uh, almost a daily, uh, uh, happening in Israel to all businesses, not only Arab, but small and medium sized and big businesses throughout the country, Jewish and Arab alike, but a lot of murders um, almost on a weekly basis in the Arab sector. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the platform for using this kind of crime and violence um, by external factors, and this is something that I've been writing and yelling, is very, very convenient for uh, instigators like Iran. Others have done that in different places in the world, and there was no reason to believe why they wouldn't do this right now as well. And recently, the Shabak has uh, declared or uh, said publicly that uh, factors associated in the Arab-Israeli sector with crime and violence um, have been found smuggling weapons with the help of Iran, um, not once, not twice. And this has been made public. This was very recent and just before, a couple of weeks before uh, this particular war had begun. But I'd just like to stress once again, this is not an Israeli-Palestinian war. This is not an Israeli-Palestinian war. This is not an Israel-Hamas war. This is a war waged and planned for a long time by Iran. They know that to galvanize support, to recruit support amidst the Islamic world, the extreme Islamic world against Israel is very easy. All you need to say is Al-Quds. All you need to speak about is Al-Aqsa. They even call this uh, campaign Al-Aqsa campaign, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with it. Certainly the hyenas acts that have been perpetrated in the South have zero to do with Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem. But they have called it that and they know that it's easy to galvanize support in the world against Israel and the Jewish people. And they decided that they will do this, not yesterday, not a month ago, not a year ago. They've been planning this for a very long time, feeding 
their long arms. Hezbollah, West Bank, Jihad, Islamic Jihad in the West Bank. Hamas is also in Lebanon, not only the Hezbollah, the Hamas is also in the West Bank and in the South. So when we are looking at what, what is actually standing um, in front of Israel and the IDF, we have an arena for which, in my humble opinion, we need an international coalition. Here, I believe you have significant value. Each and every one of you have circles of impact, contacts, people whom you can speak to, impress upon. I have little doubt that the Americans well understand both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, what we are standing against. In fact, it is completely clear that we are speaking about Iranian-led, I don't even know what to call it, because it's a call for world jihad. It's a new world order that they are trying to create. Just wrote about it in the very recent Friday edition my um, article for the J post, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. And they will not stop at any cost. People are telling me, people are telling me that because of the tremendous presence of the Americans, and it is tremendous, nothing less, by our side in the vicinity of Israel, the Hezbollah will be deterred they will not be deterred. Iran will not be deterred. Why? Because they speak a different language. It's a different culture. It's a different mentality. Everything, and I use a Jewish term with your permission because we are Amit's family here. Everything is kosher in their eyes to do what they're about to do. And what they're about to do is first, at least in their eyes, destroy the state of Israel. They were given more fuel for this horrendous act by the fact that we amongst us were horribly divided, that they felt that the IDF was not the focus of attention, but rather the internal divisions were the focus of attention. Of course, now what the Hamas managed to do is unite everybody in the country almost to a complete and utter perfection. Thousands of Haredi uh, uh, scholars are asking the government to recruit them into the IDF because they want to help. The spirit of people in Israel religious and secular, old and young, everybody. I live on a moshav very close to the um, West Bank in the Sharon area, the undisputed Israel, five minutes drive away from the fence. Everybody, children, elderly, <laughs> taking guns and you know, taking care of the community or they are distributing clothes or they are fundraising or they are driving soldiers from the South to the North. It's unbelievable. So in that sense, this is one point of resilience for Israel. And by the way, it's a huge point of resilience. If we don't have that, we cannot succeed. But I just want to stress this fight is not gonna be an easy one. It's not gonna be from one front. It's already not from one front. The chief of police today said that there is a huge um, thank you to be said to the Arab Israeli population within Israel, but everybody is still on their tiptoes. And again, I apologize if I'm being politically incorrect, but everybody's on their tiptoes. There is a huge, huge running towards getting guns, personal guns. Everybody that can get a personal gun is getting a personal gun. Every Mushav and Kibbutz in the entire country is having turns protecting its community. 
everybody's on their tiptoes, but this is not an Israel-Palestinian war. Not Hasbarah wise, despite the fact that it still is, it needs to come out from that prism and not militarily. This is not an Israel-Palestinian war. And if the world will not understand that, we have a problem. One last word about the day after. Perhaps some people feel that it's too early to speak about the day after Gaza. The American president, Biden has said several times, learn from our mistake. We didn't think of the day after in Iraq. We turned out having a huge problem in the day after in Iraq. Iraq was a mess after we left. For 20 years, we've been bogged down there. ISIS came up, militias came up. It was a nightmare. Don't make the same mistake. And rightfully, the Hamas is not only the 40,000 armed people that are perpetrating these hyenas crimes. Hamas is an ideology. It's a culture. It's a prism of thought. It's a paradigm. And this prism of thought has been fed and nurtured to the people. Plus, it talks of Islamic Jihad and world Jihad. This is something that, despite differences, is equal to Al-Qaeda, in a sense, to Hezbollah, in a sense, to ISIS, in a sense. Each one of these organizations have different interests. But they have an ideology. If we kill 40,000 Hamas operatives, we do not kill the ideology. We cannot wipe it out. What can wipe it out? What can happen in the day after? Because we are not hoping to kill every single civilian in the Gaza Strip. That's not our goal, nor is it our goal to be in Gaza, to take over Gaza, and nobody else wants Gaza, least of all Egypt. We need an international force to sit there and to make sure after we do complete our mission, that things are stable and that the world also answers to what will happen to the Gaza Strip after we do what we need to do. So Final really, word, you. because okay. one last sentence, because I won't be true to myself if I don't mention it. Don't forget Egypt. Egypt, 110 million people, strongest army in the Middle East after Israel fed and nurtured by the U.S., is taking this issue very, very seriously. Very, very hysterical about one Gazan moving towards the Sinai Peninsula because they know what is the Palestinians in Gaza and they know what is Hamas. And they're not having it in their territory. And they know why. My answer to that, we need to find a very delicate, convincing way to have them open up to women, children, and the injured, so that at least the world will not shout when we bombard, there will not be women, children, and injured that we hurt, because this is, again, not our purpose. But in the same way, we will eliminate the really big issue that may erupt and it's on the verge with Egypt.